Welcome back to our show, to our channel. Uh, we've taken uh, the last couple of weeks off. Uh, it's been really great for those that celebrate the holidays. That was a big deal for us. Um, uh, but, you know, it's time to time to get restarted, get back to it. Um, uh, Okay, just want to check in uh, for a moment. It looked like we were not streaming, but it does, in fact, look like it's working. So happy to see that. <laughs> I was a little nervous there for a minute. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers, but uh, our last episode at the end of the year, last year, um, uh, there were some technical glitches, and I had problems with the camera, and I had problems with the microphone, and we muddled through, but it was uh, it was pretty stressful. So. Um, Okay, good. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore that. Assume everything is going well here, and let's just keep going with it. Um, so, uh, for those that are new to the channel, I'm gonna give you a quick, brief update. Um, I'm the president of Liftport Group. Liftport has been in the space research business for about 20 years. Um, first. Uh, before Liftport, under the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts Research team as part of the Space Elevator team. Um, then we created Liftport to keep going on the Space Elevator. We did that for a couple of years, 2001, 2, and 3 under the NASA umbrella, and then 4, 5, 6, and 7 as Liftport as the company. We uh, focused on the robotics and the mechanics of climbing, so we have a bunch of uh, a bunch of robots and stuff over here. So pretty proud of those, that part of our team. Uh, we also worked on carbon nanotubes and other nanotechnologies. While we never ultimately had the breakthrough necessary to build uh, a carbon nanotube tether to space, um, we did learn an awful lot. So pretty proud of that part of the team as well. Um, Ultimately, the company closed as a part of the uh, economic crisis um, in 2007 and 8, and we were pretty quiet for a long time. We had uh, an important but otherwise failed Kickstarter in 2012 as we started looking at the lunar elevator. Um, we asked for $8,000 and we got $110,000, which sounds like a win, but ultimately it was a giant catastrophe. And I've talked about that before. Um, fast forward to 2017 and 18, that's when the current version of Liftport was started. And we really got uh, start growing our team a little bit in 2017 and 18. Um, instead of focusing on the Earth elevator, we shifted gears to the lunar elevator, which we're 100% focused on now. Uh, we haven't worked on the Earth elevator for a long, long time now. Um, during the pandemic, we wound up doing a lot of events. We called it conf uh, conferences as a service, and we did 27 digital conferences, virtual conferences, uh, some for ourselves as our own account, and then some for uh, several other organizations, the Moon Society, Mars Society, Space, uh, uh, the Chief Sci Scientist of U.S. Space Force, Mars Coin, and the uh, uh, Foundation for the Future. So hats off to those folks, because honestly, they kept us alive and functioning during the pandemic. And now as the pandemic has shifted yet again, uh, there's less of a need for for virtual conferences. We are going to continue doing um, hybrid events. We've got some scheduled. We've already done one with the Mars Society. We've got some others on the books. Um, and so we're going to do hybrid events, but we're also going to start building our own virtual conferences. Uh, I'll share about that in a minute. Um, and that led to doing podcasts. So now I think we're up to our even dozen shows. We've done about 12 of these now. Uh, they'll be available on various platforms in the next couple of days. Um, well, I'll make sure I get everybody the links probably on the next episode. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes before I jump in. Um, uh, we've got um, Taylor doing audio editing in the podcast. 
uh, Leah is kind of my right arm. She's doing all sorts of stuff, usually behind the scenes. So hats off to you. Thank you. Um, uh, Yusuf is working on our YouTube channel. Um, our new person, uh, Rachel, is writing a bunch of uh, content. What she's doing, she's taking our interviews and uh, writing about them. So I'm going to post a bunch of links here uh, in the chat. Um, so we're posting everything here at the blog of better futures. So a ton of stuff has happened in there. Um, oops, that didn't happen. There we go. A ton of stuff has happened in there. Um, we've had, uh, you know, talks with uh, Dr. Uh, Doug Plata. Sorry, it's a little hard to do this two things at the same time here. Um, Dr. Roger Lanius, Dr. Robert Zubrin, um, uh, um, James Burke at the Mars Society. So we've had some really great um, speakers of our uh, on our on our show, and Rachel has taken on the work of uh, capturing that and and uh, turning it into text form and passing it along. So I really encourage y'all to come in and see what we're doing. Uh, we are trying really hard to build um, this part of Liftport. We're calling it Better Futures. Uh, this part, this new subsidiary of ours, into a um, fully fledged media, space media uh, and, and news. Well, yeah, new and new site. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of some of the big stuff we're working on this year into 2023. Uh, so definitely take a look at that. Um, and with that, I'm going to jump into kind of today's program. If you have any questions, please uh, please let me know in the chat. Um, and let's uh, let's get to it. So we're kind of alternating between having guests and doing policy analysis. Uh, I, we, we do have a bunch of guests on the, uh, on the docket, um, but I don't want to do any spoilers right now on that. Um, uh, but we got some really cool stuff coming and I think it's gonna be pretty, pretty exciting. Um, we are focusing on that intersection between uh, space, of course, space, but um, that intersection that corresponds with space and national policy, uh, finance, commercialization, and capitalization. Uh, so that's a pretty big topic. And what we're doing is we're going to host a conference series uh, Coming up in the end of March, we're gonna do we're gonna do four of these, one per quarter uh, for the whole year, and that conference is really gonna focus on you know how these things play together, right? How does national policy, both in the United States and beyond, how does national policy? Uh, uh, how, how does it prime the pump for commercial space efforts? And then at what point do those commercial space efforts don't, you know, no longer need the federal support and they can stand on their own? So we're going to show what we're going to do today is go through a recently released report and kind of talk about that evolution. But if you're interested in this kind of conversation, uh, daregreatly.space is the home of both our conference, our newsletter, and our podcast. So um, we're building this into kind of a full service brand. Now this is all under the Better Futures uh, subsidiary of Liftport Group. So 
Um, if that's a little confusing, believe me, uh, it has been confusing to us as well. Um, so hopefully that will become clearer over time. Um, you know, we're, we started doing these conferences as a service, as a way to uh, just keep the lights on literally and figuratively during the pandemic. And we're trying really hard to get back into the business of working on the lunar space elevator infrastructure and other lunar infrastructure. Um, so hopefully you'll see something about that in the coming months. Um, but for now, to keep the lights on, still going to do podcasts, still going to do conferences. And we are doing podcasts and conferences for other clients as well. So if that's something you're interested in, please let me know. All right. And with that, I'm going to jump first into um, a couple papers that came out uh, this week. So the very beginning of the year, we're starting off with some pretty neat stuff. Um, I have... Uh, I have two, two papers. This one I'm only going to talk about briefly, the Center for Space uh, Policy and Strategy at Aerospace Corporation. Um, if I get time, I'm going to jump into this a little bit further, enabling a new space paradigm, harnessing space mobility and logistics. This is a pretty important document. Probably I'm not going to get into it today. I might have to save it for next week. Uh, but I'm going to post a link to it to just whet your appetite. Um, the Aerospace Corporation is uh, arguably it's one of the think tank organizations for the U.S. Space Force, Air Force, and other components of the DOD. Um, these folks are really smart people, and there's uh, hundreds maybe maybe a thousand or two thousand PhDs working at this organization to just keep um, keep America's defense program uh, at the at the at the top of the food chain. So pretty smart folks. This one's a really interesting document. If you get a chance to read it, uh, please do. I may I may have a chance to uh, to get into it today. But in case I don't, I wanted to make sure that everybody had access to it. So let me just post the link here. I have a lot of tabs open. Uh, sometimes it's a little, sometimes it's a little challenging running running this show because there's a lot of tabs happening. Um, so really want you to pay attention to that. Uh, if I get a chance, I'll come back to it. But I really want to spend the bulk of today's program on another document that also came out this week. So I'm gonna uh, stop sharing this and share this. Um, uh, so the organization EuroConsult, um, they do, market intelligence uh, for the space economy. Um, I learned something about them today that they're nearly 30 years old. I was very surprised to see that because I don't think of the space commercial sector as being 30 years old. I think of it more as a, a decade long. So what that says to me is they're looking at the whole space economy from originally from the government perspective and by the by their name you can assume that they're in europe they are but they're also all over the, uh they've got a, a center in washington dc and a couple other places as well um really interesting organization we hope to have them as speakers at the conference i was mentioning a minute ago the dare greatly dot space conference um but this is what they do they build market research reports and they sell them right that's that's their job that's how they make money and um just yesterday they came out oh here's their locations there we go paris washington dc montreal yokohama sydney and toulouse um they just came out with this space economy report i want to dig into it we're going to dig into it quite a bit here but you know here's some here's some important uh, here's some important numbers. Um, 
uh, there is a lot of money in this sector. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we're building the show that we're building, why we're building the conferences that we're building, because we think it's pretty important that this space economy be uh, tracked um, because it's going to change the world and somebody should be watching and paying attention. Um, I love this idea that uh, the space economy could grow um, just about $200 billion um, in the next eight years. Uh, there's some people, by the way, that think that number is low. Uh, Bank of America and Chase each came out rep with reports last year and the year before that both look at $100 billion, I'm uh, sorry, trillion, uh, uh, trillion dollar economies. So even though this is 600 million, 600 billion, I'm going to mess that up all day, uh, 642 billion by 2030. Uh, two other organizations, Bank of America and Chase, uh, both came out with reports that put the economy at over a trillion dollars. So this is actually light. And it's interesting to me that it's so light. And I don't fully understand it, but we're going to talk about that a little bit here. Um, uh, some of the value chain that they're building, um, market markets by client types. We're going to get into this a little bit more, but pretty fascinating document. Um, I recommend taking a look at this free ex extract, which is here. Just you know, download it. It's free. They want your email address. Uh, that's the trade. Um, uh, their their document their their core book uh, is five thousand dollars to all the way up to fifteen thousand um, dollars. We're going to talk about that again in a moment, but I mean that's their business model. So I got to you know say hats off to them for having nine editions of this document um, at these prices. Uh, I, I think that's actually pretty reasonable. If you're the kind of organization that that can benefit from this and you have those kind of resources, uh, Liftport's too small. We would probably never be buying a, a report like this, uh, at least you know, not, not in our current iter iteration. Um, and this isn't the kind of thing we would necessarily need, but I'm certainly interested in it. And they have a whole bunch of other documents and other reports. So... Uh, if that's your thing, I definitely recommend it. I've been I've been paying attention to EuroConsult for a couple of years now, and they never cease to uh, uh, surprise me. So yeah, pretty pretty impressed here. Um, great organization, good people, uh, solid research. Um, I recommend uh, the the free extract because that's what we're going to be looking at today. And with that, let me actually jump into it. Uh, um, okay. So it just came out um, yesterday. I've talked a little bit about Euroconsult, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more. Um, I don't exactly know the direct relationship, but I understand that there's a lot of ISUers uh, that work there, um, International Space University folks. Uh, so that, to me, that gives them a certain amount of clout and credibility automatically. Uh, anybody who knows me knows that I've been a part of ISU community for a long time now. Um, I'm not afraid to throw my school under a bus uh, when they make mistakes because they definitely do. But overall, I've been pretty impressed by the by the folks I've met, either classmates or former classmates. Um, and I tend to watch the organizations that my classmates go out to because... Um, because they tend to be interesting organizations. So, uh, yeah, Euroconsult's been around for a long time. Let's go ahead and jump into this uh, 
to this document. Um, first of all, you know, there's not really a great definition for what the global space market really is. Um, I know that the Bureau of Economic Analysis, that's the, uh, that's the U.S. federal program that tracks things uh, for the government. They, they, they ultimately are responsible for things like the consumer price index and other things like that. Um, cost of living changes, things like that. Um, and their version of what the space economy is, is pretty different from this. Uh, also, um, the Space Foundation out of Colorado Springs has a somewhat similar but not the same report that they issue usually around uh, March or April. Um, the numbers are similar but not the same, and the, the differences and nuance are kind of important. Um, for example, I don't really like the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, view because a, it's a much smaller number, and B, I don't think it encompasses the depth and width of the space economy. Um, so take that for uh, for what you want. Um, so the the very first thing I look at is like what is what is the global space market by their definition because that's going to drive a lot of this. Um, uh, you know, and so they answer that it provides a snapshot of market dynamics, competition about evolutions and key drivers for all key segments of the space economy and its applications. I think you'll see in a minute that the space economy and its applications might be the most important element to this. Um, just kind of keep that in mind when I get to the application section. Okay. Um, also, uh, and this is the piece that surprised me a minute ago, where I said that data is derived from over 30 years of tracking all levels of satellite space value chain. Um, Europe and their space program and the United States and our space pro pro program, they have evolved very differently, right? Um, uh, they started roughly the same. They start, you know, NASA was a single budget and arguably with a single mission in the early days to go to the moon. Whereas the early days of ESA, by the way, ESA is quite a bit younger than, than NASA. I don't know the exact year, but it's quite a bit younger. Um, you know, they have multiple budgets, you know, they have money from multiple budgets, meaning multiple nations. Uh, and they don't have the same uh, North Star vision that America uh, has often run under, uh, especially in the early days. Um, so when you're tracking data from all the way back 30 years ago, the NASA of 30 years ago, the European Space Agency of 30 years ago is pretty different than where they are now. So um, while their historical data is probably pretty easy to verify, um, current data, because there's so many different organizations, probably very hard to track. Um, but I really like, uh, I, I think the idea of their 30-year-old model and 30-year-old databases to look at the, uh, the the depth of time of these various programs. I think that's very impressive. Uh, so far as I know, there is no other organization that has that. So if no other reason that, uh, for you to be interested in EuroConsult paper, uh, that that is a compelling reason by my definition, by my standards. Um, you know, this document's going to look at market dynamics. Well, you know, that's a that's very different on our side of the Atlantic versus their side of the Atlantic. But remember, I showed you all the places that they 
operate from, uh, they're not Eurocentric anymore. Uh, and so this is a global space economy, and they really stress that. We talked a bit about the pricing. Uh, I'm not going to try to sway you one way or the other. Um, I think, I think understanding the uh, the outlook of the commercial and government satellite value chain is pretty important. Um, but I also don't really care about the satellite value chain. Ultimately, while I think that's interesting and it's a driver of of most, if 90% you'll see in a moment, most of the space market is driven by satellites. I mostly only care about lunar development. Uh, Liftport focuses on you know, uh, uh, lunar infrastructure development. So while it's great to see a thriving environment, um, it's not really the thing that we we at Liftport necessarily care that much about. Um, however, since it is the driver of the economy, projections for the next 10 years are probably pretty darn important. Um, and honestly, if we were gonna spend five grand, five 5,000 euros for the classic report, I would almost certainly spring the extra 2,500 in order to get the data sets, because I would want to go deep into some of the data sets. Uh, again, I'm not aware of any organization that has their depth and width. So uh, there are great, and we're going to talk about them, there are great consultancies and advisory firms that do similar products. So I don't want to put these folks ahead of everybody else. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm saying they are good in their own right, uh, because we do hope to have uh, Folks from Bryce, from Astrolytica, uh, Astrolytical, um, uh, Space Capital has a really great report. There's a bunch of really good reporting organizations out there, and we're going to go through a lot of their stuff. Um, so again, don't want to put one over the other. I want to acknowledge them for their strengths and weaknesses. Um, but the downloadable data set, if I was going to spend 5000 I would spend 7500 for the data. Um, and I had to sign somebody on the team to really dig into that. Might be me because I'm a nerd for numbers like that. All right. So what are we doing here? What, are, what, is, what does this paper really get you? Um, well, first of all, it's long, right? It's 80 pages. Um, but they're only covering like one section at a time, basically one section per page. Uh, so no matter how good their analysis is, you're only getting one page on a topic. Uh, for me, page 35, uh, chapter two, satellite manufacturing, page 35, focus on the war in Ukraine and the impacts on the Russian industry. Heck, I, I think that's probably worthy of 80 pages all by itself. So um, I, I know that this document is written for you know senior executives that want just the summary of where things are. Uh, but me, that probably wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, I would want to look a little bit deeper. So I want to know about the scope and definitions of their space economy and space market. I'm not sure they're the same thing. Um, I definitely want to watch government tr funding trends. Uh, I'll show I'll show some areas I'm a little concerned about um, deeper in the, the report. And this report's only a couple pages long. This is this is definitely a marketing product. They're not giving away the crown jewels in this thing. This is the free version of a, of a 5,000 euro document. Uh, so they're not really giving us a lot of details, which is fair. I think that's very appropriate. Uh, but I'd love to see um, government funding trends. I have some questions about how they break those up. I'll share that in a minute. And I would love to see what the private investment trends look like. So again, we're going to try and get some folks from Euroconsult to come to our conference uh dare greatly dot space and uh and, and join us and kind of share some of the goodies okay
Okay. Um, I think it's interesting that there is a manufacturing backlog in satellite development. Uh, we all know that first COVID and then uh, the first, first COVID caused a uh, total supply chain breakdown. Specifically, chips got especially affected. Then the U.S. government put some uh, restrictions on other nations being able to produce some of the, ch the high value chips. And then uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, ha all of those things have had crazy impacts on satellite manufacturing. Um, and yet, and yet uh, 2022 was still a record breaking year for launching satellites. Um, I'm sure we're going to see that. We're going we're gonna to see some stats about that here pretty soon. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. There's, a, there's another piece I want to show. Um, I am curious what they have to say about launch services and the competitive landscape there. Uh, I know that that is going to change an awful lot uh, with the development of the Starship Singularity. Like... As Starship comes online, maybe maybe in the next 30 to, well, maybe within the next 15 to 60 days, depending on a lot of stuff that not, you know, SpaceX doesn't have total control over. Um, uh, we haven't seen we haven't seen SpaceX get a uh, uh, launch license approved. Uh, we haven't seen them clear the hurdles for the. Uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, that they had. Um, so it's hard to say clearly where they are. Um, uh, Elon Musk posted uh, something just a couple days ago saying that they look like it might be the end of this month, might be next month. So we'll see. He's been saying that for a while, so it's a little hard to tell. Um, and I'm a little surprised by their 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 com comment about shortage in heavy launch supply. Um, yes, there there have not been very many uh, heavy launches. Um, you know, Starlink uh, Starship is still a developmental rocket, so it's going to be a while till it's in production. They only launched a heavy once last year. There's another one coming up soon. Um, but I do wonder, does it even matter that there's a shortage of heavy launch? Because the trend in the industry is to miniaturize your, your spacecraft. Um, so nobody's building multi-trillion dollar satellites anymore. I'm not aware of a single. Is there some? Maybe there's something from the like the back catalog at NASA or ESA, but or maybe even maybe even Air Force Space Force uh, that I'm not aware of. But um, I would say in general, I'm not aware of any multi-billion-dollar satellite that's still in development. Um, maybe a big science platform maybe something going to Mars, but I can't think of any multi-billion dollar satellite comparable to James Webb or something like that. So um, I don't know why we need a whole lot of heavy launch uh, necessarily. So I think that's a little curious. Um, ground segment, satellite communication. SATCOM is gonna be making some big changes this year. Uh, we've already seen some announcements between T-Mobile uh, being able to uh, use their phones. Apple is trying to build some emergency capabilities into their phones. Uh, there's a small company called Lynx, L-Y-N-X or L-Y-N-K, Link, might be Link. Um, they're trying to build a uh, cell tower in space program they just they've launched one they've got two more either just about to launch or have just recently launched uh and and satellite communications is going to be a game changer uh this year um 
Uh, Delta is offering um, free in-flight Wi-Fi on, on a few flights. There's there's big programs to get uh, uh, airlines connected uh, in a way they never have been before. So that's going to be exciting. So watch out for SATCOMs. SATCOMs, I think, is going to be the game changer for 2023. Whoops, 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 too far. Um, we know that Earth observation was the deciding factor in 2022 for the Ukrainians to hold and, and then slowly push back the Russian invasion force. Uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of articles about how the uh, commercial, um, non-classified uh, data sets came together and helped out the Ukrainians. Uh, I definitely think that's worth looking up and, and investigating. It's a pretty interesting story. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be the story for 2023. Um, uh, this comment about cloud computing based services, uh, that's really compelling. I think that's going to be kind of important. Um, the, uh, we all know that our lives are vastly better for having cloud computing services available. Uh, I, I could do an entire hour long program on ranting on uh, chat GBT and how they're doing some interesting cloud computing work. Um, but, uh, there, there's some really cool stuff about cloud computing in space. Uh, doing, doing the, it's called compute on space. It's, a, it's about actually doing the computations in space. Now there's talk about building giant server farms on orbit. Um, I would have said I was skeptical of that, but literally yesterday retired three-star general, Lieutenant General Quast, uh, joined a little known company called um, Skycorp, uh, which uh, I don't know, always always makes me think of uh, Skynet from Terminator. But um, a guy I really admire, General Quast, and also uh, another guy I really admire, Dennis Wingo, uh, they've been talking about cloud computing as a service in space for a long time. Uh, and then you tie that in with Chris Stott and his company that is doing uh, uh, cloud compute on the moon. And suddenly that looks a whole lot more credible than I have seen for a while. Now, I've known Wingo, I've known Dennis for probably, uh, I've probably known Dennis for 20 years. Now we're not beer drinking friends. I'm not gonna claim that I know him super well. But we run in the same circles for a really long time, and and I, I you know, watching him operate, getting grant after grant after grant, uh, it's really quite impressive, and to see what he might be up to, it's uh, it's pretty cool. So hats off to those folks. But it gives me pause that maybe uh, space-based cloud computing services looks really interesting and intriguing. Um, I will throw in the caveat that whatever you're able to launch, whatever it is, um, there's a communications problem to and from. So there's an input output problem that's going to have to be dealt with. I suspect that's going to have to become an optical link, which is still very, very early in its adoption and technology curves. So that's going to make, that's going to make this a little tra challenging. And then the other thing, and the reason the original Iridium network ultimately didn't work, it worked technologically. Brilliant. Uh, Dr. Pete Swan and a bunch of folks over there uh, did a great job on the technology, um, but it was an economic fiasco. It was a legal nightmare. Um, one of the problems that the original Iridium had was it was way, way easier to build a cell tower in somebody's backyard than it was to build a satellite. Now, yes, it's easier to build a satellite 
today than it was, you know, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, but there is still this idea of technology freeze where you have to get the technology, harden it for space, launch it to space, deploy it to space. And now it's up there as a fixed asset and the next cool whiz bang technology comes along and you're automatically outdated in your technology because you have an asset that's fixed in the sky that you have no way of upgrading. So there's a technology freeze problem and an in-out problem, uh, a throughput problem. So while I have been skeptical of cloud computing in space, uh, recent changes with people I personally know have convinced me that maybe there's definitely a path, but they still haven't solved the technology freeze problem and they haven't solved the uh, input output problem. So I think that's something to be watching for. Um, I think that industry is is ripe for innovation and disruption. Um, and if these folks figure it out, that's going to be a really interesting business. Uh, finally, um, uh, satellite navigation. I mean, I couldn't get from my house to my doctor's appointment without uh, sat nav. So I think everybody knows what that's what that's all about. Um, uh, okay, this is where we're going to spend kind of some some of our time here. Uh, they've broken they've broken this report into a couple different parts. Um, I'm going to assume that everybody has a basic understanding of, of market segment one. Uh, satellite manufacturing, launch, ground segments, operations, and services. Uh, we're going to we're going to dive into those more. So just kind of hold your questions on that for a second. Um, uh, the things I thought were interesting are their applications. Like how how are we using this? Once we get an asset into the sky, how are we using this? So I think you all know about Earth observation, SATCOM, SATNAV. Um, exploration is a pretty small element here. I mean, really, uh, yes, we're always looking at new technologies. Yes, we've got rovers on Mars. Uh, yes, we, we will have a rover, I hope, in the next few weeks. Um, on the moon, China has one now. Good job, China. Um, so that exploration market is important, application is really important, but I would not say that as a driver of any of these big numbers that we're going to see in a minute. Um, I, I want you to take a close look at the space logistics, it's a new category, and the and what I think is brilliant is that. It's a gas station. It's a gas pump as their icon. I think that is really clever and really accurate. Um, I want to point out the similarities between the security icon of a shield with a check mark box and the customer's icon of defense. It's just a shield. Um, you can imagine that each of these three, commercial, civil, and government, uh, commercial, civil, and defense, all utilize each of these nine market segment applications. So those are satellite comms, earth observation, satellite navigation, exploration, science, security, space logistics, technology, and space tourism. Now, anybody who knows me knows I have been skeptical of the space tourism market for more than 15 years, maybe more than that. Um, hats off to all the folks who are trying to do it. I hope they are successful. I have a lot of concerns about that. Um, I am glad that they are not the ones that we are betting all of our, all of our futures on. But good luck to them, sincerely. Uh, but back in back in the days when Spaceship One launched and the, the X Prize was finally won, uh, space tourism was all anybody was talking about. That was the total conversation. And now 
arguably it's at the bottom of the list. Um, and I think that's probably where it needs to be. I hope that, that people that are able to fly enjoy their flight. I hope they're safe and healthy and happy when they come back down. Um, but I don't think that's the market that we're going to pin our future on. Um, unless you decide that the Starship Singularity is really about point to point from Los Angeles to New York or New York to, to London, um, if you count that as space tourism, then that's going to change everything. But I, I haven't counted that as space tourism. I think that's a, going to be a robust logistics market to get people to and from, which is not on this list. Um, this customer section, you know, I've been referring to this as ACDC for a long time, for about two years now. And I, I think of it as academic, civil, defense, and commercial, ACDC. They don't have the academic component in this list. I think that's a pretty big error. Um, uh, academic research was the earliest driver of space. It was the pioneer driver of going to space. It's, it's now not the driver, but the, uh, let's see. It's not the driver, but it's the, I don't know, it's maybe the link, the link for it, the linkage for it, that without the academic research, you wouldn't be at the levels that we are going to space. So I think it's actually a pretty big mistake to leave the academic component out. And um, uh, and and I think that if we, if we, continue to ignore their contributions, um, it's just going to skew the data more and more. And then the final thing on this page is the regions. Take a close look at this map. I don't really have any way of blowing it up without uh, messing up my, my presentation. But a couple things to really pay attention to. One, uh, Mexico is considered a part of Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate. It's not, it's not accurate, I don't think. Um, and Mexico has its own uh, new, it's only about a six year, seven, seven or eight year old space agency, but hats off to our uh, Mexican buddies because uh, they're doing really good work there. And um, I'll show you why I bring this up in a minute, but one of their charts looks really misleading, and I think it's because they put Mexico in the wrong box. And then the other thing is Middle East and Africa. I think that is super misleading. Um, Africa has about 17 national space agencies in various stages of development. Ghana announced their creation, their study of one just uh, uh, just last year. They have not fully enacted it yet. Um, uh, I think they have the potential to be a powerhouse. Uh, there's talk about developing Africa into uh, the African space agencies into the equivalent of the European space agency. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, I think that should definitely be recognized as a as a potential you know, near fu near future change. But I also wouldn't put Middle East and Africa in the same box because uh, the United Arab Emirates has a very robust Moon and Mars program, and both Israel and Iran have the capabilities of going to orbit, uh, whereas Africa has none of those things. Uh, as far as I know, Africa does not have a single launch facility in the whole continent. So I think it's actually really misleading to uh, to push those two things together. So um, yeah, it's a little it's a little interesting. It's a little interesting how they uh, how they dealt with their data. Um, we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, I'm trying to be mindful of time. Uh, yeah, got to speed this up a little. 
um, launch services. That's what everybody pays attention to. Launch, launch, launch. As cool as I think SpaceX and Blue Origin and you know, hats off to the folks at Virgin. They launched yesterday, but didn't quite get what they wanted. I think there was another launch anomaly yesterday. Was it Astra? I'm not sure. I think there were two launch anomalies yesterday. But let, let that sink in for a second, that there were two attempts to go to orbit from two new players is a really big deal. Everybody pays attention to launch services. I'm going to let you laugh like I did when you see just how significant that is in the economy. Um, and then the services component, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's talking about Uber and Lyft. Are they finally being recognized in the space economy? I really don't know the answer to that, but I do know for sure that Uber and Lyft are not recognized in the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the U.S. federal reports. So... I'm perplexed by this. Um, so let's look at this. It's a $464 billion economy. Uh, by the way, this piece, this non-contracted piece, I don't know what this means. So I, I, I'm, I'm completely at a loss what that is. You know, the, the civil sector, the defense sector, the commercial sector are all pretty well understood. By the way, I have some doubts about this, the defense sector numbers. Um, I'm really curious where they got that. That's not available in this report. Um, I, I don't know that I buy into that number. Uh, and I don't think I buy into the government civil number either, $31 billion, because the NASA budget alone is $25 billion. So that means the rest of the world combined is only six billion. Absolutely not buying that. Again, that's why this this forty billion unaccounted for. They call it non-contracted. I don't understand that. I cannot figure that out. But these civil numbers and defense numbers look low to me. Um, whereas, whereas I do believe their their commercial numbers. Take a look at it from this perspective. The launch segment that everybody is so excited about, by the way, um, we're doing an analysis on uh, YouTube channels that, wa that are space-focused YouTube channels. So far, I have 125 channels. I know there's at least 50 to 100 more. Uh, it totals 126 million subscribers and a combined view of uh, 18 billion B, 18 billion views. And a lot of them are paying attention to SpaceX, right? A lot of them are paying attention to SpaceX. But SpaceX and the whole launch services market, all of it, only accounts for $10 billion dollars only accounts for 2% of the global space economy. I have a hard time wrapping my head around that because that feels like that would be bigger with, with government and defense numbers if they lined up to where I think. So I'm very perplexed by this. Um, this, $364 billion out of $464 billion, um, I mean, I kind of feel stupid saying it needs to be better described, right? Like how uh, that's 80 percent. That's about it's not quite 80, uh, but it's about 80 percent of the whole market. And if they're getting down to the level where they're going to say what 1 percent and 2 percent of the market is, this needs to be better described. If I paid 5000 euros for this and this was my report, I would be angry about that because the bulk of the report is not being, in this case, on the free version, is not being supplied. So this leaves me with a giant gaping question mark, uh, which is quite irritating. Uh, so um, maybe that's what you're paying 5,000 euros for, is to answer this question, which honestly, for some people, that's a, that, that justifies 5,000 euros. Um, 
I love this. Uh, the combined client types of government and civil, if these numbers are correct, um, it's only 14% of everything. The rest of it, 78%, is all commercial. And that is why billions of dollars are moving into this sector from the venture capital angel community. That's one of the reasons that gives me hope that our lift port uh, lunar space elevator infrastructure can be built is that there is plenty of money going into this sector. For the first time in my career, for the first time in the last 20 years, billions of dollars are going into the sector because billions of dollars are being earned from this sector. That's why I think we have a future. That's why I haven't given up on working on the lunar elevator. This tells me that there is a future in this field. So numbers like that give me hope. And then probably the last thing I'm going to talk about today is, again, this region section. Um, we've already talked about, you know, there's 34 Latin American organizations. I got to think that a big chunk of that is because they put Mexico in with the Latin America segment. And, uh, and I don't have any facts for this. This is just guesswork and supposition. But... You know, I kind of know what I'm talking about. So I think that this number is kind of misleading. Same exact thing for Middle East and Africa. Um, breaking that out would probably be a very revealing. Uh, it does not surprise me about Asia. Asia is actively growing. Um, uh, Korea just announced a few weeks ago the development of a uh, na national space agency. And I kind of feel like this is underreporting Europe, uh, but again, I don't have any, I don't have any facts on that. Um, but but the European commercial sector is growing pretty quickly. So, uh, so organizations like Starburst and a few others are doing a lot of work in Europe. So, um, I think. I think the Principality of Luxembourg itself probably has 30 organizations operating there. So the, finally, this brings me back to the question of you know, where, where are they getting this data? This data, it's great if it's true, but I do have to question if there's a garbage in, garbage out problem, because I suspect there's a lot of unrecorded uh, transactions in this field. Um, so curious, but hard to say, right? Hard to say. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Uh, cash is king is one of the most obvious sentences I've ever seen in my life. Um, uh, the market for where the you know near future looks is definitely spooky. So this is worth watching. Um, the last thing to talk about is that uh, Euro Consult, I'm going to read this directly. Euro Consult anticipates that satellite demand will experience a four and a half uh, times increase, 450% increase over the next 10 years with an average of 1,704 satellites to be launched every year versus 382 over the past decade. Okay. First of all, I think averaging over the next 10 years is crazy because uh, uh, I think there's going to be a spike. So I wouldn't use the word average. I would have tried to turn that into, uh, uh, you know, this says that 10, 10 times 1,700 is 17,000. There will be 17,000 new satellites in the sky in the next 10 years. That's how I would write that. And uh, to compare that, there's about 7,000 satellites today. To compare that, 20 years ago when I started in this field, there were 400 satellites. So four to 7,000 to 17,000. I'm sorry, 400 to 7,000 in 20 years. And from 7,000, to 17,000 in 10 years from now. Uh, I think that's astounding. I think that's astonishing. Um, and I think that gives us, you know, a lot of hope. 
you know, in this industry and this, uh, this space economy that we're trying to grow. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close off. Um, uh, sorry, I want to come back to it here. Um, Taylor, thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, we're going to be running these programs every, every week, twice a week on, um, on Mondays and Wednesdays at this time, uh, five o'clock if you're on the West Coast of the US. Um, and then uh, happy to announce that the Mars Society is going to start a new program with us, uh, Red Planet Live, starting on uh, January 17th. Um, they're going to run that program once a month. And we have some other stuff that we're not quite ready to announce yet. Uh, but watch this space. We're trying to grow this, uh, this media channel. So with that, everybody, thanks very much for being a part of this. Thanks for being a part of the show. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. And let's watch how 2023 unfolds because I think it's going to be exciting. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, y'all. Thank you.